Welcome in everybody to our next Divisional Draft Grades video. Today we are doing the NFC East. A new quarterback has entered the division. Was it the right selection for the Washington Commanders? We'll get to that in a little bit here. Before we dive in, if you could take just a second to hit that like button, I really appreciate it. It really helps me out and it's a free and easy way to support my channel. But without further ado, let's get started. Alphabetically speaking with the Dallas Cowboys whose draft actually, the more I sat here, thought about what I was gonna say for this, I kept bumping up my grades on this draft actually. Was it perfect? No. To give you the grade out the gate, I'm gonna give it a B, but I originally had a C plus. And the more I thought about these picks, the more I, everything kind of made sense. And I think this has actually got a good chance of working out for Dallas, even if the value wasn't always perfect. So you start at the top with Tyler Guyton. And there is, there's so much to break down here. But I do want to start by saying they trade down to take Tyler Guyton, which gives them that top 75 pick that they then use to take Cooper Cooper BB to pair with Guyton on this offensive line. We're going to get back to that as something that I really like about the overall process for Dallas here as a reason why I've lifted this grade up. But Tyler Guyton alone in the first round, I have issues with that. I do. For me, off of my evaluations, I don't, under I don't understand why Tyler Guyton is the guy, oh my God, we got to get him in the first round, whereas you look at guys like Kingsley Suomatea, Patrick Paul, Kieran Amagaji, and they're like, oh no, those guys are late second, early third round picks. Tyler Guyton, he's got to be a first round pick. Like, no, th they're all in that developmental tackle cluster. I get Tyler Guyton has exciting traits. So do those other guys. It's not like Tyler Guyton showed up at the combine and like blew everybody out of the water, right? He's a very good athlete. He's got upside. I understand that side of things. I do. It's just, look, there is a ton of risk attached to this pick. And I know Cowboys fans are going to be like, oh, you, you didn't like the Tyler Smith pick. Look how that turned out. He's a Pro Bowl caliber guard. Yeah, you're right. It worked out. You don't always know that that's going to be the case automatically just because this is the team that happened to do this process a couple years ago and it worked for them, right? We'll find out. But I do think the risk outweighs the reward at this particular spot. I think there's a lot better football players to be had. I also think, I mean, they got a little bit lucky with a guy like Cooper, like Cooper BB being there at the top of the third because they had that 24th pick. They could have addressed this whole kind of versatility, increase the floor of the offensive line, all that, that, that we're going to get to with Cooper BB. They had that 24th pick. They could have just taken um, Jordan Morgan out of Arizona, who I think is a much higher floor tackle, gives you a little bit more guard flexibility out the gate that Tyler Guyton does not. Um, so, you know, you could have moved Morgan inside and kicked uh, Tyler Smith outside. I think it ultimately would have accomplished the same thing that they got to here. Um, granted, you're getting that extra player, that extra swing at an even higher upside tackle than a Jordan Morgan. So, you know, I, I, I think the end results here is better than just taking Jordan Morgan at 24. But I do think they got a little bit lucky with a prospect like Cooper BB being there in the third round. So I want to, we'll get back to Marshawn Nealon, but I do want to talk about Cooper BB here um, because I actually had a higher overall grade on Cooper BB than I did on Tyler Guyton. I think those were both firmly second round prospects. Um, but as I just mentioned, a huge steal for him to be there nine picks into the third round in that pick that they got um, from Detroit in that trade down. And I think if you're taking Tyler Guyton afraid of what he might be as a starter right away, you get a lot of added flexibility when you're able to land Cooper BB because I think he's a super high floor guard, an absolute mauler, fits everything they like to do systematically in their run game. He's a good pass protector. He's played some tackle. And I also think he could be a starting center for you long-term or right away if you like what you see from Tyler Guyton. But I also think Tyler Guyton, most likely you're going to get to camp. He's going to be getting his ass kicked by Micah Parsons and Demarcus Lawrence and Sam Williams. And they're going to be like, yeah, we should probably wait a year for him. And then you can take Tyler Smith, put him at left tackle, slide Cooper BB in at left guard. Hopefully he can find someone to play center for you. Maybe Connor Williams wants to come home. I, I don't know. Um, but it just raises the floor of the Tyler Guyton pick. And I love lumping these together considering this was all kind of part of the process together, right? They took that 24th pick and turned it into Tyler Guyton and Cooper Beebe. And there's a best case scenario where you have a 
you have a high-end starting guard in Cooper Beebe, who's a fantastic athlete off the ball, a really high-floor interior offensive lineman. And if Tyler Guyton hits, there's a world where this turns into a monster slam dunk for them. Now, I don't want to oversell Tyler Guyton. I'm not sure he's going to work out. Again, it does all come back to that. But the more I looked at this, the more I thought about what they pulled off here, you put those two things together, and like the two moves together for me is an A. But I do have a grading criteria to follow here, so um, that'll probably show up a little bit more in the final grade when we, you know, well, I did reveal it's a B. And then the Marshawn Nealon pick, that actually grew on me as well when I kind of looked at, okay, the edge rushers that had come off the board, it was a bigger need as well than it kind of felt like on draft night when all the bullets are flying Um, because they have Demarcus Lawrence, they have Sam Williams, Micah Parsons, obviously, um, but they did lose Dorrance Armstrong, who played about 500 snaps for this team. Demarcus Lawrence getting up there in age, and, you know, Marshawn Nealon is exactly that type of player, someone that can be a smasher as a like an inning eating innings eating run defender on early downs that can also be a part of your pass rush package just as Dorrance Armstrong has been for them. So he, he replaces that role now, but he's not unlike what Demarcus Lawrence was coming out of Boise State. Not the most incredible athlete, but a great bull rush, a high effort, bigger bodied edge rusher. I don't think he'll ever be the efficient kind of I mean, there was a year where Demarcus Lawrence was a defensive player of the year candidate. I don't think Nealon can be that, but as a late second round pick, when you look at the edge rushers that had come off the board, yeah, I had a little bit higher of a grade on Braylon Trice and Chris Braswell, but I actually really do think this is the player I would have taken for Dallas if they wanted to go edge. I have a third round grade on Nealon. You take him at the end of the second round, I'm I'm actually okay with that. You know, if I'm taking an edge rusher in the second round, I I want to see a world where he can at least become a number two starter for me. And I actually think Neyland has that upside when they've had so much success with guys of this play style. And I think eventually, again, I don't think he'll be as good as Demarcus Lawrence, but can be 90% of Demarcus Lawrence, get you 45 pressures, play great run defense. Um, You know, and then you have Sam Williams as your as your kind of designated pass rusher who gives you a little bit more juice off the edge, a little more speed and bend. It really fits in nicely here. So that one I originally had as a B. When I really thought of the fit and the scheme fit, I had to bump this up to an A. I think he's going to be a good player for them. And I don't think he was getting past Detroit at 29 either. So that's worth noting, being a you know hometown kid and someone they were linked to. Um, So we already talked about Cooper BB. Now, with how I'm kind of praising this draft, you might be saying, well, why a B? You know, that sounds like an A draft when you put all that stuff together. And this is where I do ding them pretty substantially. Maurice Lufau, inside the top 100 of the draft, I, I just don't think you need to take this player. I, now, I, I gave it a D as opposed to Green Bay. I gave an F for taking Hopper because, you know, this is actually a legitimate need for Dallas, whereas Green Bay took Hopper, who had the same grade on as Lufau. I think a pick or two later on Hopper. Um, but at least Dallas, like you're coming off a, a playoff game where you got ran all over and you didn't just spend a second round pick on a linebacker like Green Bay had. So I understand the need, but I don't understand the need to take this player right here. I think there are plenty of mercenaries out on the chopping block on the street you can find that can give you what Luafau gives you. I think you can wait on a Luafau if you don't get him. There's a couple other players in the draft that has have some size and run defense. You know, Luafau is a run defending linebacker. He's around the ball, loves to hit, get involved in the trenches and all that stuff, but just really no ceiling on the player in my opinion. I don't know that he's going to carve out a starting role in this in this defense. He might because their linebacker room is such a joke right now. Um, but, you know, I, I hope I'm wrong on the evaluation and he turns into an absolute stud. But I just I just did not see that in lieu of foul. So pretty significant reach for me. I gave that pick a D. Uh, but you get to day three. They don't have a fourth round pick. But, man, Kalen Carson basically in the sixth round here, the 39th pick in the fifth round. There has to be injury stuff related to him because, OK, he doesn't go in the second round fine he doesn't go in the third round it's like okay we should probably be thinking about Kalen Carson here he gets all the way through the fourth and fifth rounds it's like no 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 there's something else going on here because you're talking about a full-sized corner with great tape Um, he's got solid speed he's got great zone feel physical man corner 
a trash talker, models his game after J.C. Horn. He was a top 10 corner in this draft for me, and to see him fall this far, I mean, it's easy for me to kind of pound my chest and be like, no, this guy should have gone on day two, but I just with this player specifically, I really feel like coming off the injury where he got hurt at the end of Wake Forest, wasn't able to participate in the senior bowl, was late to do his workouts, that kind of stuff. Definitely feels like there's some medical stuff going on for him. So you hope he can stay healthy, but man, if he does, this is the team that just stole Deron Bland as a fifth round guy, as a quality starter for them. I actually did think they needed another corner in that room, whether it's as a starter to replace Jordan Lewis or just in terms of depth, it was really concerning if anybody went down. But I think he's your CB4 immediately, and there's probably going to be a moment in the season where he gets an opportunity. And we want to really pinpoint the guys that are going mid to late day three that have a chance to be like legit starters and impact players. I see that in Kalen Carson. Um, and his biggest knock as well is the ball skills. He's in a room with Deron Bland and Trayvon Diggs. So, number one, you're still going to get interceptions from your defense with those ball hawks out there. But maybe those guys can teach him a thing or two about getting his head around, trusting himself a little bit more, and finding the ball. So, really like this fit. Keep an eye on the injury potential there. But one of my favorite day three picks by far. Definitely made up for the Lua foul pick. Um, then they go Ryan Flournoy, uh, Flournoy, solid pick, big body, you know, kind of, I almost said hyper athlete, but very good athlete, looks the part. Uh, my take on him was, you know, you, you get down there in Mobile in person, you see Ryan Flournoy, Flournoy in, a, in a random red helmet, and you're like, why is Julio Jones here? Uh, kind of looks like that, physically speaking. Uh, Got to improve his ball skills and ability to attack the football a little bit more. He kind of is a, is a classic arms catcher, but... Uh, you know, a solid pick at the at the end of the sixth round. Nathan Thomas got a lot of love late in the process. People remembering uh, remembering Kevin Dotson coming out of UL Lafayette. I believe Robert Hunt also from UL Lafayette. So, uh, you know, that school has done a good job with this type of archetype. Uh, this guy obviously goes a lot later than those two players, so we'll we'll see. I didn't actually get to his tape at the end of the day, but, uh, you know, solid pick. I I'm interested to see what he can do. More guard depth, if nothing else. And then... Um, uh, he played tackle in college. I think he'll slide into guard. Um, and then Justin Rogers, a nose tackle. Uh, so this is interesting to me because they drafted Mazzie Smith to be a big nose tackle last year. He lost a bunch of weight. Uh, a lot of Cowboys fans were saying it's been coming out lately that it was actually Mazzie that chose to lose that weight. Um, not that this late seventh round pick really relates to that, but it kind of does in the sense of if you're going to keep Mazzie light, I think Justin Rogers, if you really wanted to go, you know, with a bunch of guys at the line of scrimmage, goal line defense. He was one of maybe three draftable true nose tackles in this class. He was my third out of the group after Sweat and uh, Christian Boyd out of Northern Iowa. So for, for a very late seventh round pick to make sure uh, he's coming to your team instead of, uh, you know, trying to find him as an undrafted free agent, I think it's it's a good pick to, to get him in the building. Uh, it brings a size profile uh, that it's it's getting harder and harder to find these days. You know, 15 years ago, you could find a Justin Rogers in your backyard. Not so much any day, a, anymore. So um, that pick was was pretty solid to good. Overall, again, Dallas Cowboys get a B grade for me. I bumped this up from a C plus. They made some frustrating picks on draft night, but when you really reflect on the whole process, you know, I think in the first three picks there, they had a good strategy. They improved their ability at the line of scrimmage, which was going to be really their biggest weakness. Linebacker, I think they probably could have done a lot more. Not a big foul guy. That dings the grade, but um, again, making up for it again with Kalen Carson in the fifth round. A bit of a roller coaster of a draft that I ended up liking more than uh, initially, initially perceived. Okay, then we got the New York Giants. They stay put at six. They get their playmaker in Malik Neighbors. You know, this has been a heavily analyzed pick. We don't have too much to say here. Uh, they choose not to go quarterback. That's probably the bigger thing to reflect on here with McCarthy sitting there. I think it's a good call. I don't think McCarthy is too much better of a prospect than Daniel Jones was coming out. Daniel Jones has never really had a real offense around him in terms of legit weaponry. You've now given that to him. I think they still know Daniel Jones is not their forever quarterback, but uh, certainly things can look better with the Malik neighbors in there. And then for whoever you get in the future, you have a much more, you know, livable, um, thrivable uh, surrounding cast there with a guy like neighbors who, as I've said, is the highest graded receiver I've ever done in the seven years, seven plus years of, of, 
you know, scouting wide receivers and having this channel um, not named Marvin Harrison. So real talent to get there uh, out at the sixth pick. Pretty easy selection for them. Um, second round, they go Tyler Newbin, who you would think I would be higher on than I was, considering I'm a Gophers fan. I was like, you know, really pounding the table for Antoine Winfield as a top 20 player in that draft. He ended up going around the same point Tyler Newbin goes here um, to the Giants. I, I definitely don't think he's Antoine Winfield. He's just not a good athlete. I compared him to guys like Jordan Fuller, Cameron Curl. I think he's a good high floor safety. I'm not going to slam them for this. He was my sixth overall safety, so um, for him to be the first safety off the board, I'm going to ding them a little bit there, but I will admit this safety class was, you know, that's not the position for me to really stand. Like, I'll do a little bit of that and saying, yeah, I would have gone Javon Bullard, Cole Bishop, Tyke Smith, I think are going to be better, more impactful pros, like higher upside players at least. Uh, maybe not the floor of Tyler Newbin though, but uh, what I'm saying is this position group is not really the one that I'm comfortable like sitting here pounding the table for my evaluations. It's it's a very scheme and flavor of the month. Like what type of style safety are you looking for? I could understand why they wanted to go with the Tyler Newbin when you just moved off of a safety with four six speed and Xavier McKinney, uh, who does a lot of similar stuff in your defense. So he can kind of take that job right away. It's a very solid pick. There's just other players that I preferred believe it or not, as a Gophers fan. Um, but then you get to Andrew Phillips, top of the third round. Love this. I had him as a second round pick. He, you know, he doesn't last too far in the third. I think it's great value. I'm not going to quite go as far as like certified steel. Like he's not a perfect corner. He's skinny uh, and, you know, doesn't have amazing long speed, but the quick twitch, the coverage instincts, the route squeeze anticipation, it's phenomenal. He's like a slow uh, Jair Alexander with tackling issues. So, that sounds about like a you know low end number two entering the league, a third round pick. I think it all adds up. I do think he'll be uh, starting for this defense opposite of Deontay Banks. You've got Cordell Slot in there. Secondary was was certainly I think their biggest need after wide receiver and and maybe quarterback. So I, I like the pick there. Good first couple days of the draft. Pretty chalk. Uh, then they take Theo Johnson. I think a lot of people are going to say this is a steal in the fourth round. I'm actually in a completely different ballpark. Now, is it the worst idea to gamble on a guy that tested like this uh, at the combine on day three of the draft? No, but we're very early on day three of the draft. We're in the seventh pick of the fourth round. This is much closer to a third round pick than it is a day three pick. Theo Johnson was my tight end 12, so we saw about five or six names get drafted after Theo Johnson that I think are better tight end prospects. I think you're you're chasing the testing numbers where you're not watching the film on Theo Johnson, where he's not a good football player. He's not as good of a run blocker as some of these other guys like Tip Raymond and A.J. Barner. He doesn't run routes. He doesn't move like he tested. He turns like a semi-truck. There's a lot of reps where I think A.J. Barner looks more athletic than Theo Johnson. Now, you get him untouched on a straight line. He can run up the seam. He's got really good ball skills down in the red zone, um, but he underproduced overall at Penn State. And it's not like Penn State was like really itching to get this guy the ball. Now, some of that is on Penn State. I think a lot of it is also that Theo Johnson just, he's not the athlete that he tested. I really don't think he is. So, to me, I think this is a reach, and I think they'll regret not going with just a better football player in Cade Stover, who looks a lot faster on tape than Theo Johnson. Jared Wiley, who the Chiefs took in the fourth round. Tanner McLaughlin went to the Bengals. Uh, Jaheim Bell goes later, I think could be a, a more interesting kind of chess piece type for Brian Dayball. He went later. Uh, I mentioned A.J. Barner. He went later. Eric All goes a few picks later to the Bengals. I had all those guys ranked ahead of Theo Johnson. So I know the, you know, workout was exciting. He's going to be the first guy you take in the 25th round of all of your Madden fantasy drafts. He's going to be a god in the video game, but the tape just told a different story with him. So I, I it was it was a lot early for me on Theo Johnson. Uh, Tyrone Tracy is about where I kind of saw him going. Uh, I will admit. Kamani Vidal goes later than this. I think it would have been much more up their alley, just a kind of Devin Singletary on steroids with better speed. Uh, that's obviously kind of their type. They signed Devin Singletary, so I would have liked that a lot more. 
Um, but if you're not taking Kamani Vidal, I think Tyrone Tracy was probably your next best bet. If you want someone that has actual starter upside in the fifth round, interesting player coming out of Purdue six year um, in college. He started at Iowa as a receiver, went to Purdue as a wide receiver, then converted to running back in year six. And he plays like a running back. A lot of explosive runs. I think as a out the gate as a compliment to Devin Singletary with a little bit more juice on receiving downs, uh, some more home run hitting potential. Uh, and then, you know, you kind of see what he makes of those opportunities, what he looks like in camp. And um, if you're kind of threading the needle and finding a steal here in the fifth round with kind of a unique backstory type of player who's only in his second year at the position, uh, it's a good process. So I think it's a good pick. I just would have gone with Kamani Vidal. And then they go with Darius Masao uh, out of UCLA. You know, this is kind of the perfect example on Dallas's draft. It's like, you, you don't have to take Luafau in the third round. You've got your Darius Masao's there in the sixth round. He's a solid run defender, high effort player. Sure, not quite as big as a Luafau, but um, he's played a lot of football. He'll be a good backup in a special team. I didn't see a whole lot more than that there. So that that added up. Um, ultimately, I'm going with an A- minus on the Giants. Not a ton of picks. The Malik neighbors pick, it's going to be hard for that to not be a great pick. Um, you know, Newbin, we, we broke that down. And, and Phillips, I think there's a very good chance you're getting at least one starter in the secondary out of those two. A good enough chance you're getting two. Um, and then kind of it's, it's Tyrone Trace is the only excitement I saw on day three. So going A- minus on the New York Giants. But then obviously the title of the video, the Philadelphia Eagles draft. I just, it just doesn't make sense to me. Like, obviously, Howie is incredible. I think he's better at this than pretty much everybody else. Brett Veach is, like, the only other one that I think you can make an argument for. But at the same time, it's like he just does what's obvious and just takes the breadcrumbs and the free presence that the rest of the NFL gives to him. And he's been able to sustain this Super Bowl caliber roster because of drafts just like this. It's incredibly frustrating as a fan of any other team not named the Philadelphia Eagles. So Eagles fans just know that a lot of people hate you because they're just jealous of you. The first two picks, I mean, we could spend 30 minutes breaking this down. We could spend 10 seconds. Like, you get Quinion Mitchell and Cooper DeGene. With Quinya just landing in your lap at 22, I had him as, a, as a, I think the ninth or maybe eighth best player in this draft class. It's the Eagles' biggest need. He's the best cornerback in the draft. My pro comp on him is Darius Slay, who's regressing, getting older. Even if Quinion isn't going to play right away, he's going to be playing within the first couple years, and he could be a pro bowler the second he steps on the field. That's the type of player we're talking about with Quinion Mitchell. And how he didn't even have to lift his finger to make this happen. But with Cooper DeGene in second, how he did have to go make something happen. He trades up, uh, gives up uh, uh, their, they had a second round pick. They flipped it for a, a third round pick. And then they did like a fifth round pick swap too. So they didn't even lose assets. They just moved down in the draft with other picks to come up for Cooper DeGene. Take a guess whose pick this was that allowed them to come up for Cooper DeGene. Washington Commanders, you guessed it. So inner division. For some reason, they're letting the Eagles come up and get a true top 20 player in the draft in Cooper DeGene. Someone that if they took him at 22, I would have raved about that fit with the need, all the things we talked about, Quinion Mitchell. But I actually think Cooper DeGene in year one is going to be the bigger impact player for the Eagles because as that big slot role, uh, or if they just play him at safety, we'll see what they end up doing. Um, either ones could be needs for them, but specifically my, my pro comp on Cooper DeGene was like a diet version of Jalen Ramsey, because I think when you can move Cooper DeGene into the slot with his run defense and his zone feel and some of the stuff he can do from that spot, you know, the Rams used to do that with Jalen Ramsey he was the best corner in the league. And they're like, you know what? You're actually most valuable to us as a slot corner in our base nickel defense. I think that could be Cooper DeGene year one, or they could just flip him back to safety where I think if you're drafting him as the safety, He's the first safety off the board here, and he's the best safety in the draft. Also, could just chill with Quinion Mitchell. You could play Avante Maddox, who's been a very good slot corner for them. If he stays healthy, you've got your three-piece corner set that's been a good group for them for a while. Wait a year, you slide into Gene and Mitchell as literally like a Pro Bowl caliber tandem, I think, next year. There's just so much flexibility in, in the room on that defense that... I've been waiting for them to address for a long time. They 
you know, found these Band-Aid options with, well, well they're more than Band-Aids, but short-term answers, and guys like Slay and and uh, Bradbury out there, usually they go with, like, linemen and stuff, but it, they've done so much of that lately that they had the flexibility to do this with their secondary. Just one of the most generally amazing draft halls that I remember with a, with a pair of, like, top 50 picks relative to where these guys got drafted. It's it's incredible. But it, do, it does not stop there. Um, they take Jalex Hunt at the very end of the third round. Okay, okay, whatever. I, I would have drafted Austin Booker if you wanted that, you know, developmental edge piece. But I, I see what they like in Jalex Hunt. He's brand new to the position. Um, he was a safety two years ago. Really fluid, easy mover. Uh, he, he will not be playing for the first year, maybe two in Philadelphia. But as a late third, if they felt like they wanted another guy in the wings there to maximize from the mentorship and, and talent in that room after you traded away, um, Hassan Reddick, uh, that's that's totally fine. Not gonna rave about the pick or anything. You know, I I certainly would have preferred as well to go with um, Xavier Thomas. Uh, so there were other players I liked, but you know, I could see this working out um, if if they believe in the small school kid. Honestly, that's probably my least favorite thing that they did uh, during the draft. You get to day three. What, what's not to love about Will Shipley? Uh, automatic. Um, uh, Kenneth Gainwell replacement over time. Gainwell hasn't been as good as I thought he would be coming out. I, uh, you know, kind of a down year last year. Wouldn't be surprised if Shipley just takes that job as RB two behind Saquon Barkley. They clearly have a use for these kind of speedy, uber shifty receiving back types. Uh, so fits right into that room. You know, Boston Scott and Kenneth Gainwell weren't forever for this team. I think Shipley's got a ton of talent uh, to potentially be upgrades at the next level for those guys. I was a big fan of Will Shipley. I, I, I'll say it again, just because I'm not afraid of it, of my take. I compared him to NFL Reggie Bush, not college Reggie Bush, but the guy that's like, can be a consistent 500, 500 type of dude, 500 rushing yards, 500 receiving yards um, in a team like this. I could see it. J Jalen Hurts doesn't really like to use a check down, but um, they do like this style of back. Uh, then they take Aniya Smith, Anaya Smith, uh, you know, middle of the fifth round. Okay, okay, whatever. A little bit earlier than than I would have taken him, but he, he's a kick returner. I like how he fits in with the existing receivers, where you can put him out there for certain packages. You know, throw him a bubble screen and. You know, use them in the slot, rotate them into the backfield at running back. There's a lot of different ways you can use them, but specifically with the new kick return rules, hard to argue with with Smith, um, a real natural punt returner. That was um, the biggest strength I had on Anaya Smith. But then you go Jeremiah Trotter, the legacy pick, his dad, an Eagles Hall of Famer. What's not to love about that? Uh, but I had a third round grade on him. You get him in the middle to late fifth round. I mean, <laughs> look, I'll admit. As I saw him starting to fall a little bit, I'm thinking about this more. The chat's asking, why is Jeremiah Trotter falling? Why is he falling? Why is he falling? I'm seeing NFL teams pass on him time and time again, taking other linebackers ahead of him. And the more I think about it, I'm like, all right, if he didn't declare as a true junior, so have that kind of allure of like, oh, what could he be? He's young. If he wasn't Jeremiah Trotter's son, and if he didn't play at Clemson, is this really a third round linebacker prospect? And I'm like, yeah, no, probably not. His tape was very mediocre. He's not the biggest guy. He's not the fastest guy. So maybe I'm chickening out of my evaluation a little bit because I did slap a third round grade on him. But I'm wondering if I got caught um, just like kind of the rest of us with the intrigue here. We'll see where that goes. I still, at the end of the day, despite that, think it's well, well, well worth the pick. Obviously giving it a, a certified steal at the end of the fifth round. I said his tape was average. It's polarizing. He makes some plays. He's got some of the same instincts that you look for from a guy named Jeremiah Trotter. Um, he doesn't have bad speed. He doesn't have bad size. He's just a little below average in terms of those, or, or, or not below average, just um, non-elite in those areas. I don't think he's going to like win a starting job right away. I think N'Kobe Dean and, and a, a you know run of veterans will beat him out. Um, but in a year, if you don't resign Devin White uh, with another year of development to compete, could he be a starting linebacker in the fifth round? Yes, 100%, absolutely, despite some of the stuff I just said um, about understanding why he fell a little bit more. But I I'm still going to give this a certified steal. I think there's a lot of worse linebacker prospects that went ahead of him. Um, then you go Trevor Keegan, uh, 17 picks later, really good value. I saw him as a potential starting guard down the road. Um, with some stuff to clean up with his feet, but 
was, you know, after Zach Zinter. Keegan was definitely my favorite Michigan offensive lineman and uh, just a mauler, tough dude. I, I think can eventually compete for starting work. Uh, probably not in year one, uh, but very good value there. And then, dude, Johnny Wilson at the top of the sixth round. Like, dude, I, okay, I get third round. I even kind of get fourth round. He's a weird player. Teams were uncomfortable with his size profile. But they overthought Johnny Wilson, in my opinion. And honestly, this isn't even the best landing spot where he's, you know, if he gets on the field, he's going to be competing for targets with A.J. Brown and Devonta Smith and Dallas Goddard. I just don't know how much love there is to go around here. I don't know that he's going to be, you know, a slam dunk pick here. But the value and the caliber football player that we're talking about here, if you get an injury to get a guy like Devonta Smith and A.J. Brown, where you are going to get an opportunity for Johnny Wilson to step in, then we might be talking. But, dude, I think he separates as a wide receiver. I think he's got underrated speed. He, he makes some incredible catches with that size. He's got to hit the jugs machine. He's got to get stronger hands. I think he showed at the Senior Bowl. That's something he's worked on. Um, was really sure-handed down there in Mobile. I'm a little afraid that the Eagles are going to try to convert him to tight end as they've done with some of these other kind of late round flyer types. They've had like two or three or four guys in the building that are all wide receivers that they're like, oh, let's make you a tight end. I, I don't love that for Johnny Wilson. I think he totally deserves an opportunity to compete as a wide receiver. So, I, I mean, I had a third round grade on him as a wide receiver and he has like legit star potential. If his weird route running style and and outlier frame translate to the NFL. So had to pinpoint this as a steal. I really hope he gets an opportunity somewhere. And I'll be I'll be pretty ticked if the Eagles um just kind of get lazy with this and just say, oh, you should switch to tight end. Maybe it works, but I, I just I think that's a little lazy with with really the good tape he showed at wide receiver. We'll we'll really see where this goes. Um, and then they take Dylan McMahon out of NC State. Athletic center, solid pick for them. Play strength's a concern for me, but um, as a backup center to a Cam Jurgens, hard to argue with that stylistically speaking. Um, has all those the movement skills you look for uh, to do the same stuff they want to do systematically with uh, Kelsey retiring. And to make things even better, as we're mentioning some UDFAs, uh, I thought the Eagles got some interesting names here, man. You got um, Gail, uh, Gabe Hall, Baylor defensive tackle. Really nice swim move. That's about it. But can you add more to that tool belt? We'll see. Um, and then Georgia running back Kendall Milton was kind of a my guy in this draft. I, I had a lot. I had him ahead of a lot of running backs that got drafted. Definitely more of a bruiser that they don't have in that running back room. I wouldn't be surprised if he makes the team just because between Shipley, Gainwell, and Scott, it's like you don't really have any sort of power in that room if Saquon gets banged up, who he's got a history of getting banged up. So I like that one. Kind of shades of Damian Harris and Zamir White there in the SEC out of Georgia. And then a pair of developmental tackles, too, that are worth keeping an eye on, given this is the team that took Jordan Maialata as a basically total flyer and turned him into a franchise left tackle but um, you know Gottlieb Ayedize and Anim Dunkwa probably butchered those names but you know trades you guys to keep an eye on in this specific room with one of the best old line coaches in the league so I'm going with an A plus grade for the Philadelphia Eagles really the only criticism in this entire draft is there's a couple other players that would have gone with instead of Jalex Hunt but it is not enough to ignore all of the other amazing picks they made. This is the highest graded draft I've given out so far um, in this series. An A-plus grade really trying to highlight this as one of the sensational drafts of this process. And we'll, we'll wait and see if we get another one of those. Now, needless to say, that's not going to be the Washington Commanders here. Um, probably my least favorite draft in this entire cycle. Um, so very polarizing conversation here. Uh, they did a couple things I like. It's not going to be all negative here. And I I want to acknowledge I could be wrong about Jaden Daniels. I'm willing to give him a chance. He's got exciting traits. But, man, they just did so much stuff that I, I can't get behind it. And number one is taking Jaden Daniels over Drake May. I, I think it's a um, massive decision, obviously, for the future of their organization. I saw May as a 
quarterback worthy of being the number one pick in most draft classes or at least any given draft class incredible arm young player you know some footwork stuff to clean up but with Jaden Daniels I know you see the running highlights and it, and him throwing to wide open wide receivers like Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas Jr. and and the explosive passes that he has and you say why does he not have this crazy upside I see way more issues as a passer in Jaden Daniels. He's three years older. He doesn't slide. He scrambles to run. He doesn't scramble to pass, unlike Drake May, who's a much better play extender, actually, in terms of looking to throw and using his arm to decimate you down the field. Like, yeah, it's exciting when Jaden Daniels jukes out four defenders and runs for 40 yards, but you can do that a lot easier without the injury risk. And a lot more consistently when you keep your head up and you've got a rocket arm on the move and you can just hit your receivers while you break out of the pocket 40 yards down the field. It it reminds me of like, you know, with Justin Fields in their deep dive heading into last season when I was like really trying to pump the brakes on the Justin Fields hype. I was like, okay, I love the Justin Fields running ability, but if you add his rushing yards on top of his passing yards, he was like second to last place in passing yards again just taking his rushing yards adding him to his passing yards and that wasn't counting for all of the other quarterbacks rushing yards and how that would push them up the charts so it reminds me a little bit of that with Jaden Daniels the more I watched him as well I, I I got more and more worried about his arm strength now he throws a beautiful deep ball and that's the allure with him is he's got great deep accuracy and incredible scrambling ability Those are fun traits together, but you pair that with uh, less of an arm talent to hit tight window throws to really maximize the full field. There was a throw against Arkansas where he draws the defense offside. I love that, Um, but he's trying to push the ball 50 yards downfield. And again, I wish I could show some film, but the SEC is like, nope, no film this year. YouTubers, you can kiss our ass. Thanks, SEC. You know, no need to let people know how good your football players are. Um, But anyway... You know, he gets the defense offside. He gets the free play. I love that from Daniels, but really steps into it. Brian Thomas screaming five yards wide open behind the defense. And he underthrows it by five yards. Brian Thomas has to work back for the football. And I'm like, man, Daniels can barely get the ball, you know, 50 yards uh, with a second hitch. Like, uh, just was kind of like, ugh. Um, And some of the tight window throws, you just don't see the zip on that fastball. Not to mention the fact that he just is not consistent at all at seeing and targeting the middle of the field. So, man, um, I've broken this thing down quite a lot. I think a lot of Washington Commanders fans are there with me, um, but there's obviously going to be a collection of people that are going to slam me for this and call me a hater. It's just what I'm seeing, man. I I think they made a mistake. Now, I will admit he's in a better surrounding situation than Drake May. I'm very worried about how the Patriots are going to be setting up Drake May for success. So, Look, there's a world where Jaden Daniels turns into the 14th best quarterback in the league. He's a, he's a competitive pick here with the second pick. And because of how the Patriots handle Drake May, he's a flop. I, I understand that. Um, and I wish I wish Drake May went, went somewhere else, honestly, in terms of my take being right. Um, but if you put Drake May here, I'd be much more excited about him. So I'm going to go with a D. It is what it is. We'll see, we'll see how this ages, right? It's going to be a fun one to look back on in two, three years. Um, now... They get Johnny Newton in the second round. Like, we can at least have some fun with this one, man. Like, you just have to take the guy. He's a true first-round talent, a top-20 player on my board. I would imagine they saw him similarly. The only, like, minor thing you could really say here is defensive tackles, like, the only truly good position on this team other than maybe wide receiver. You know, they have Jonathan Allen. They have Deron Payne. They traded away those edge rushers and kept those guys in place. Um, yet you're going defensive tackle here. I I understand some of the redundancy thing there, but look, I think there's a way to get all these guys on the field. Defensive tackles, they can't play every single snap. So you get an extra guy for that rotation. I was never really all that excited about Fedarian Mathis as a second round pick. Like this is light years better than that as a second round pick in terms of upside and athletic juice. It's a real strength though, because Mathis does defend the run. 
But there's also ways for Dan Quinn, just as he showed in Dallas, he's going to find ways to get all these guys on the field. You can put all these guys in between the tackles, move your edge rushers around, and get creative with it so that they are all on the field. Um, but I think Newton's just a better pass rusher than Deron Payne anyway. And I think Newton's weakness is run defense. I think that's probably why he fell to the second round. So, um, you know, they're all kind of complimenting each other. It's just too good of a player to pass up. I have to give this an S grade for a certified steal to get an impact defensive player in the second round. Love it. And then, okay, so they go Mike Sainer still and Ben Sinat in that trade down with the Eagles. But I, this is where I get a little lost because... Okay, you went with the process of, wow, there's a true top 20 player, a first round talent sitting there in the top of the second. We got to take this guy no matter what. And you go from that to then all of a sudden, uh, nope, we're going to trade down with the Eagles and let them get the top 20 player. And we're going to take some, you know, second round types of talents. I kind of under understand the process, but I just would prefer to go Cooper DeGene plus your third round pick than Mike Sainer still and Ben Sinat. And, you know, would Sinat have been there in the third round? Maybe, maybe not. Don't know how many teams were, were in on him like I was. We'll, we'll get to these picks, but from a draft process perspective, right? Okay, if Sinat's not there, Jatavion Sanders was. Very similar kind of caliber, sort of undersized tight ends. Uh, Mike Sainer still, you would have been taking Cooper DeGene, right? Or Tyke Smith was there, who I think is actually a better slot corner than Mike Sainer still. So they're good players. But I am going to ding them a little bit for not taking Cooper DeGene and giving him to the Eagles. Both of these picks in a vacuum would have been A grades for me. But to pass on Cooper and to give him to the Eagles, got to be a B plus. Like, who did you think they were going to take? Now, let's break these guys down with these teams on these fits. Because I really don't hate this as a process to get these two players in the building. They both make a ton of sense for this team. You get Mike Sainer still... Like I said, I think the second best slot corner in the draft, um, depending how you viewed Tyke Smith, if he's a safety or a slot corner, um, but Sainer's still the best true slot corner in the draft. They need that position desperately. I do really like that they are pinpointing Quan Martin as a safety, who they took in the second round last year. I think it helps out that safety room with that clarity to push him back to that group. They still need to kind of confirm on the field that that's what they're going to do, but that just only makes sense for me. Now, if they just took him to replace Quan Martin, who never really got a true opportunity in the former regime with Ron Rivera, who hated young players, and you're just kind of writing off Quan Martin, who I did think was a talented, good pick in the second round last year, then we're going to be able to look out back on this with some hindsight and say, no, that was bad process. Why didn't you give Quan Martin a chance at least? So that'll be interesting to follow, but I'm hoping, I'm staying optimistic that they're going to do this right, put Quan Martin in that safety room to compete with Percy Butler, Derek Forrest, Jeremy Chin. No one's at a lock in that safety room. But, you know, Sainer Sane still, great instincts, amazing first step, tough dude. You can throw him into the box uh, as a slot corner. Uh, he's going to be a good football player for him. I, I really do think that. So, um, again, would have been an A. Trade down stuff is is where they get the ding here. Um, but then you go Ben Sinat, and this was an interesting moment for me because I really pounded the table for him, was in on him as a second-round talent, ended up with a second- to a third-round grade for me, but a top-60 player or so. So, you know, get him at um, the, the 21st pick, you know, pick 53 or whatever. Like, I was fine with the value there. I think he has the highest upside out of any tight end in this draft, not named Brock Bowers. A lot to like about the fit here. Now, I wish I went that little extra step because on first watch, I put him over Jatavion Sanders, and then I kind of chickened out a little bit. I was like, oh, am I being a little bit too crazy here? He ends up going two whole rounds ahead of Jatavion Sanders. Um, still ultimately view those guys pretty close. Uh, but anyway, fun to see him be the second tight end off the board here in the second round. I think there's a lot of room for growth for him as a run blocker. But I also love the fit here with Washington. I do. You know, he's definitely got the potential to be that kind of dynamic mismatch problem as the long-term Zach Ertz replacement. I know it's weird to say that here in Washington, um, but at least the long-term Zach Ertz role in this offense because Ertz had a lot of success in Arizona. He got peppered with targets. Cliff Kingsbury loves two-by-two -two spread formations. Um, where he can put a tight end out there as a blocker on bubble screens, where Sinnott's going to be a monster, um, probably even better than Zach Ertz in that role. 
um, but somebody can flip the ball to, use it in the short to intermediate game, and by flexing them out wide, you're neutralizing their weaknesses in terms of um, you know, blocking in line and all that stuff where I think Sinat does have to grow a lot more. Um, but I think he can also get to the point where you can show that in the huddle. Teams have to prepare for that spread formation, but also um, he can really get to a point as a blocker where I think you can stick his hand in the dirt in line and trust him that way too, more so than you ever could with, with Zach Ertz. So I do really like him as a fit. I'm excited for him. He's a guy I'm targeting in my um, kind of dynasty drafts and, and that kind of stuff. I don't, you know, year one, probably going to be a little bit more of a development on him just because of the run blocking is not quite there yet. The route dis- uh, the route kind of um, feel and just instincts as a wide receiver still need to come along. He's far from a perfect prospect, um, but a fun one and a good fit here in Washington. Now, I, again, could you have played this a little differently, gone with Cooper DeGene, gambled on Sinat or Jatavion Sanders, who could do a lot of the similar stuff with the 303 pick instead of burning that on Brandon Coleman, who was a late day three grade, like for me at least, like, yeah, I think they could have navigated this situation a lot differently if they were in on Sinat. I don't think this was the only way to get him or Jatavion Sanders. Like both of those would be specifically good fits for this offense for the reason we broke down. So good players, good value, questionable process. Third round, fucking hate it. Um, I don't, I don't get what they were seeing in these guys as third round talents. I, I just don't. Uh, Brandon Coleman is a sixth year developmental tackle prospect. They're gonna move him into guard. That's fine. Um, but we saw him move to guard at the Senior Bowl. He wasn't moving his feet, just like he wasn't at tackle. Um, for me, you know, this late into his college career to be this raw is a massive red flag. He's got the traits. I do think he's going to be better at guard than he is going to be at tackle. Maybe he works out with NFL coaching, but if you had to go guard, so many other players that would have gone with. I mean, Cooper BB goes, you let him go interdivision to Dallas. So you've, throughout the course of this, you've helped the Eagles get Cooper DeGene. You helped Dallas get Cooper BB. Like, that's real stuff. That's real stuff, real draft grade criticism that could come back to bite this team in the ass. I don't see a starter in Brandon Coleman. I don't. By the time he's ready to play, he might be 26, and I don't know that he'll ever be ready to play. And by the way, I know we're just laying into Washington here, but, okay, you see Brandon Coleman as a guard, but did you need a guard or did you need a tackle here? So not only did you take the wrong guard, but I look at the roster here and I'm like, you know, interior O-line, Nick Allegretti, Tyler Biadesh, Sam Cosme. I think you work with that with Jaden Daniels, who we broke down, needs a little bit of O-line help. But you just cut Charles Leno, you got Cornelius Lucas at left tackle, and Andrew Wiley at right tackle. So take everything we already said in the second round, but you can also question them not going tackle earlier. Specifically someone like a Blake Fisher, who I really like. I think they really miss the ball going Brandon Coleman over some of these other guys that I think can be like fringe starting tackles. Guys like Javon Foster, Christian Jones, even Delmar Glaze, close to home, played at Maryland. Hell, even throw Roger Rosengarden in there, who we were critical of the Ravens taking him at the end of the second. I think that's a hell of a lot better pick than Brandon Coleman, who went like three picks later. And he's a tackle. So I pray for Commanders fans, for Jaden Daniels' sake, that I am dead wrong about Brandon Coleman. And maybe he is a tackle, and he's going to be an all-pro. I pray that he is, and roast me when it happens. But good Lord, I did not see that in his evaluation. Really thought that was a bad pick going with an F on that one. I mean, that's a freaking that's the 65th pick in the draft. I, I cannot explain that one. And I see a pick like that, and I know I'm sounding so fucking full of myself right now, but I see a pick like that, and it's the same team that took Jaden Daniels over Drake May, and it just makes me feel, feel so much more confident that this team is, is kind of in their own heads a little bit right now. And then they do it again with Luke McCaffrey at the end of the third. I mean, dude... <laughs> If this guy's name isn't if this guy's last name isn't McCaffrey, if this isn't Christian's brother, there's no way anyone's thinking about him here. He was playing quarterback a couple years ago. I think his game speed is really slow. Still needs to work on his routes. He's got good hands. Like for a guy that was playing quarterback a couple years ago, really impressed with how he attacks the football and comes down with it. Rocked up guy. I hope he proves me wrong. I'll be pulling for him. But man, not only is this extremely early, 
I think if you have to have a slot wide receiver, there's countless options out there on the market right now. Go sign a Tyler Boyd to be a much more bigger help for Jaden Daniels. They're probably not going to do that now that they spent a third round pick on, to me, a developmental slot wide receiver. I know he ran well in his testing numbers, does not play with that speed on tape, by the way. But if you had to stay put and you had to take a corner, oh, a wide receiver um, with this pick because you didn't pick again to the fifth round, okay, Malik Washington, hello, in your backyard, played for Virginia, monster season, incredible athlete, a lot of juice, um, last name Washington, I mean, come on. Uh, you keep keep going down the board. Jaquan Jackson, I think Anthony Gold, Isaiah Williams, better true slot wide receivers than Luke McCaffrey. I just, I can't, man. I can't. Um, I, I see picks like that, and again, I get it. I could so just be wrong. I hope these guys are studs. I hope for Commanders fans, for Jaden Daniels fans, I'm an idiot. I was watching the wrong tape, and I can't watch football, or I don't know ball, right? I hope, I hope that's the case. I really do. But if I'm going to sit here and tell you what I watched, where I would draft these guys— I see them make those picks. I see them take Jaden Daniels ahead of Drake, man. I'm like, they got the wrong script. So I went D minus on Luke McCaffrey just for the fact that he's still new to the position. Great bloodlines, fun player. I'll be rooting for him, but I cannot defend him over the guys that they could have had there. And that's just for slot wide receivers, by the way, right? You had other guys like Troy Franklin. Would have loved to see Johnny Wilson in this offense and a different chess piece for Cliff Kingsbury. Um, I mean, Javon Baker, Tez Walker, Jamari Thrash, just so many more talented wide receivers than this. So, um, yeah, it, it's rough, man. It's really rough. Um, I feel bad for Commanders fans. You've had it rough, and you thought it was going to be much better here. I hope it is. I really do. Um, but day three wasn't bad. Jordan McGee, fun developmental linebacker. Right around the range, I saw him go on and use my LB10. Uh, a good spot for him. It's, a, it's actually a low-key, like, deep, fun group of linebackers. It was... It'd be uh, to be you know optimistic here. I thought they made some really fun signings, and they're going to move those guys around. And Dan Quinn's going to have a lot of fun with that group and a, a kind of a high energy, athletic guy to be a, you know a mentee in that group. I, I could see him becoming a starter someday. So I like that. Dominique Campton, safety out of Washington at the end of the fifth round. I think he's good value. I, I think he's a very good third safety to have. Can you know put him in there in dime packages? He can do some stuff. He's a very balanced full-size safety with good athleticism an older player that never had like the crazy production or high-end play so to speak but never really stunk either so as a special teamer and just really good safety depth that late I like it uh, and then Javante Jean Baptiste you know bigger name transferred out of, out of Ohio State went to Notre Dame six-year player never really clicked in terms of pass rushing uh, but a high energy run defender I think he could play a role uh, on that D-line um, maybe, I, I don't know. I'm not a big Javante Jean Baptiste guy, but it was fine enough in the seventh round. So I will give them some credit. They got some interesting UDFA pickups. Uh, Marcus Roseme, Jack Saint, I had a higher grade on than their third round pick Luke McCaffrey in the third round. Uh, a lot of traits just was kind of an afterthought in that passing game at Georgia. Um, Arizona running back, Michael Wiley, really smooth receiving skills. I uh, was interested in him as a day three pick like how he fits in that room as a potential long-term Austin Eckler type. Uh, obviously not the caliber, but you get the point. And then uh, Texas safety, uh, Texas Tech safety Tyler Owens, uh, he pulled up running his 40 at the Combine. There was a lot of eyes on him potentially running in the 4-2s, so we didn't get that final number from him. Um, I mean, his tape sucks, but he's a Big 12 safety that got horrible coaching. So can Dan Quinn get something out of him in, a, in one of the more under-the-radar athletic uh, most athletic safety rooms in the league, uh, an eye to keep an eye on. Uh, certainly a good special teamer if he makes the team just with his speed, and, and he does like to hit. Commander's draft is really tough for me. I give it a D. I mean, the best pick they made is arguably the lowest need that they have, and we really don't need to rehash everything else. We've spent enough time on this draft class as is, but I think they got good football players uh, in, in on you know in the second round there. There's going to be some guys that come out of this draft. And if Jaden Daniels can hit, none of this is going to matter. But you want my honest opinion on this draft class, there it is. Um, we'll see how it goes for me. And that's going to do it. I mean, that was fun. Um, very polarizing drafts in this division. I really hope you guys enjoyed. I'm sure we're going to have takes. 
of course it had to be the NFC East, which is like the least civil fan debates that you see out there. So I want to see it in the comments. Commanders fans, let me hear it, dude. Lay into me. I want to go at it with you in the comments. I want to hear all of your thoughts on Jane Daniels and the rest of the stuff they did in the draft. You know, everybody else chime in as well. Um, let's let's see it down in the comments. Please do hit that like button as well. Um, we'll have AFC East next. It's very likely going to be tomorrow as of your watching of this video. I appreciate you guys' patience. I got a little bit of a cold after the draft streams, and then we had a roof schedule to get redone here on Tuesday. It got rescheduled because of rain. I can't really record when they're tearing up the roof. So we've been a little bit all over the place with the schedule. So I appreciate you guys' patience uh, with these coming out. Uh, we're at the halfway mark with these draft grades videos. Thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of the rest of them. And we'll see you later. Peace out.